It's a type of classical conditioning, wherein, for example, you associate the protagonist, Rocky Balboa, or whoever it might be, um, overcoming adversity, sprinting up the steps of the museum in Philadelphia, raising his arms aloft, and that background music, do 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 And sometimes when you hear the music and the images are not present, of course, the music conjures images of those heroic deeds. The music forms an emotional tag. And the interesting thing about music as an artistic stimulus is that it forms a super highway to our memories. And often as a psychologist, when I've worked with athletes and they're going through a rough patch, maybe they've had a period of injury or haven't been able to recreate the form of old or are having some issues in their private lives, I will often go through their music library with them and try and find one or two pieces of music that encapsulated when they were experiencing peak performance in their careers and try to use those as a backdrop for imagery and as part and parcel of a pre-event routine. Welcome to the podcast, Costas. How are you? Very well, thank you. It's good to see you and Happy New Year, Steve. Thank you so much. So right straight off the bat, your research over many decades, an outstanding body of work on the importance of, of music and its relationship with how we exercise and, and undertake sport, how we feel, how it affects our psychology and our physiology. But before we have to go anywhere into that research, I need to ask you about, we've just heard the music to the podcast. What did you think about that? What's your analysis oh, that, of that that engendered some uh, light excitement some anticipation um it, it was a, a two chord progression uh, oh. and i think it was the perfect entree steve i'm raring to go oh right so it's actually got you in a pre-performance routine uh <laughs> situation has it fantastic that's amazing <laughs> good all right well look um costas if you could just start us off by giving us a bit of a background to you, uh, your your journey, your your uh, route through this field, uh, just to give people an introduction to yourself. Um, yes, I grew up in South London, Steve, and uh, my formative experiences uh, really came when I was very young, uh, because the flat in which I resided with my extended family was located immediately above a second-hand record store and so when it came to music I was a tortured soul I couldn't escape music because it was literally booming through the floorboards every single day um, and invariably it was the music of Bob Marley and Desmond Decker I lived in uh, a, a neighborhood with uh, many members of the Windrush generation uh, and had a lot of influence from their musical culture and really from a very young age, I got interested in how music affected um, the human psyche. Um, at school, I was good at three things, music, sports, and lunch. And invariably, <laughs> um, I went to university to study for a joint honors degree in sports sciences and music. And it was there really that my formal interest in the interplay and the intersections across these two areas, which are seemingly quite disparate, really came to fruition. So university also was a hugely um, formative experience. I spent my time uh, playing in a big band, playing jazz, Latin, funk, that sort of thing, uh, but also paying my way through uh, regular performances in local bars and restaurants two or three days a week. Um, and from there, my institution had a, um, a relationship with an institution uh, in the southern states of the US. Um, and I went out to South Alabama to read for a, a master's degree. Um, and I remember most weekends I would catch the Greyhound 
down to New Orleans and soak up the atmosphere in the French Quarter. Of course, I could really indulge myself uh, with the jazz that was on offer there, um, and that furthered my interest um, in that particular genre of music, which is really one that I, I specialize in. So um, I, I did more formal work there that I eventually uh, published. Um, and then uh, I got a, a minor academic position as a scientific officer. I started reading for a PhD. Um, I did some part-time lecturing during that time. Uh, and as soon as I completed my PhD, I got a, a faculty position. Um, and I've worked at Brunel actually for, for many years, um, having uh, been employed as a as virtually a boy. I've been here man and boy. <laughs> um, but they've been uh, very kind here at Brunel in terms of um, indulging me and supporting the sort of research that I've wanted to do. I've had a great deal of support uh, from the institution. Um, not only in terms of laboratories, equipment, research leave, but also they've, they've been fantastic in uh, helping me to promote it um, and to expound the key messages to a wider audience, both nationally and internationally. So that, that in a nutshell, is the journey that I've taken. Oh, amazing to hear. And you mentioned there just that is not necessarily an obvious uh, connection, but there is when you start thinking about it that there, there certainly is can, can you tell me a little bit about whether the opportunity to fuse psychology and music research was there for you or whether you had to carve it out for yourself have you always sort of worked in this area or have you had to sort of have a a, a respective psychology career uh, with your interests in music and then as you've got further into your career you've been able to to pull the two together well, Steve, it's been said that there's a great chasm between sport and music, but I would argue that both are culturally pervasive, both speak a universal language, both are ludic activities, they're all about play, and both are all about emotion. And I think there are many links between the two. Of course, when I was um, a young undergraduate, I had an interest in both areas and they tended to happen separately. Um, and I had a vision that they could be intertwined and they could be studied in a, uh, in a, in a rigorous and formal way. Um, because up until the point that I came into this field, most of the work that had been done was of a fairly a theoretical nature. And by that, I mean, there was no conceptual framework that uh, underscored, that served as the bedrock for the work. People would select tasks and participants and music conditions fairly randomly. And of course, the findings were equivocal as a consequence. So I trained as a musician. I told you that I was a tortured soul and really couldn't escape music as a youngster. Um, and due to those early experiences, I found that I could play various musical instruments. Eventually, it was the piano that I, I settled with, and uh, that was the instrument that I studied formally and played in, in uh, various ensembles with. So that, that happened separately, and um, I was inspired by one of my lecturers at university, um, Professor Peter Terry, who is um, a foremost figure in UK sports psychology. Um, and really, he took me under his wing. At the time, in the early 90s, he had quite a strong interest in music-related applications. And it just so happened at about the same time uh, when I was doing, or just starting out on my PhD, uh, Professor Craig Sharp joined my institution. Um, he was the first director of the British Olympic Medical Centre, um, but also a very keen musician, a renaissance man. We'd spend hours talking um, about jazz history, jazz theory, musicianship, and so on. And um, I consider myself very fortunate to have had those two professors, Peter Terry and Craig Sharp, as my supervisors. And really, it was about forging the relationship and um, uh, initiating a program of work that had never really been a formal program of work in this area. And the initial tasks really centered around 
uh, the development of conceptual frameworks and later on uh, theories, uh, developing instruments with which we could um, reliably assess the qualities of a piece of music before applying them, thinking really carefully about the internal validity, the structure of a study, how we could collect data in a valid and reliable way, and then uh, to enable us to draw inferences and make recommendations for the general public. So I guess in the first 20 years or so, just getting the area up and running before we were able to do some flashier right. things, um, you know, using neuroimaging techniques and such like, that was the mainstay of what we were doing, developing theory, developing instruments, and doing what I would describe now as some um, pretty basic behavioral research, but trying to do it rigorously to really understand what the effects of music were on the human psyche and exercise and sport. Mm. And so there's uh, just listening to that, that story, there's this um, obvious connections between sports performance and music, such as the choice of music for an ice dance or a gymnastics routine or synchronized swimming. And, and equally similarly to an art form, which is just as athletic in ballet and, and the expression of, of, uh, of physical uh, performance. Um, but I'm also just going to the goosebump moments of when I go into a bit of a trance and everyone in the family says, oh, that's, that's gone into a trance. It's when the end of the competition montage comes on. There's the, there's the editing of, of performance moments alongside music that there is an obvious connection that, that does create that emotion. Uh, it stirs the, stirs the soul. Um, just give us a bit of a, an overview as to what's the, what's the connections that you're drawing in your research between sports performance and exercise and music? Well, everything that you've said there, Steve, is extremely salient. And of course, well-chosen music, uh, if you take the music of John Williams or Van Gelis or Bill Conti, can greatly heighten sporting imagery. Um, and you mentioned yourself that sometimes when you watch those montages of peak sporting performance sets of music, you feel the pilo erection, you feel the hairs rising on the back of your neck. Um, and both the sporting images and the music can heighten our emotions and they can manipulate our emotions. Those... Um, uh, composers who have worked on film scores, for example, have an intimate knowledge of how music can be used to influence people's emotions. So when you're talking about sporting imagery and musical stimuli, marrying the two can create a really intense emotional experience for the viewer and for the listener. Um, through the um, medium of film, what we see a great deal in the application of music in sport is this notion of extra musical association. And if I break that down into uh, simple scientific terms, it's a type of classical conditioning, wherein, for example, you associate the protagonist, Rocky Balboa, or whoever it might be, um, overcoming adversity, sprinting up the steps of the museum in Philadelphia, raising his arms aloft, and that background music. Do -do -do, do -do -do. And sometimes when you hear the music and the images are not present, of course the music conjures images of those heroic deeds. The music forms an emotional tag. And the interesting thing about music as an artistic stimulus is that it forms a superhighway to our memories. And often as a psychologist, when I've worked with athletes and they're going through a rough patch, maybe they've had a period of injury or haven't been able to recreate the form of old or are having some issues in their private lives, I will often go through their music library with them and try and find one or two pieces of music 
that encapsulated when they were experiencing peak performance in their careers and try to use those as a backdrop for imagery and as part and parcel of a pre-event routine. So personally, I found that to be um, a very effective intervention that I've applied on numerous occasions. And just to touch on one other really interesting thing that you um, alluded to, Steve. Sometimes it is the job of the athlete to make the audible visible. If we take a celebrated gymnast such as Beth Tweddle and we watch one of her rhythmic gymnastics routines, it's almost as though that you can see the music in her actions. Or if we think back to the Olympics, the Winter Olympics in Sarajevo and that historic uh, moment of Torville and Dean, uh, where they used Ravel's Bolero, that classic piece, and how it became fused in the public consciousness because they were able to portray the intricacies of the music so, so beautifully in such a way that it was so accessible that it took your breath away that um, those particular moments um, also remain in the memory um, uh, and serve to characterize that strong relationship between music and athletic endeavor. But that is an example of embodying the music and using the music to direct uh, your physical actions. There are many other types of music application that we've used experimentally um, and that we've used in our applications with athletes that we might touch on today. Of course, you can use, use music as a pre-event stimulant or sedative. You can use it ambiently in the background just to create a better mood. And lastly, we've been experimenting with the notion of post-task music, where music is used to expedite and speed up uh, recovery. Right. And uh, I, we, maybe we can enter some of the, the mechanisms and, and the processes involved with that. I mean, just uh, just hearing you uh, unpack that with such clarity and um, and precision, the um, I've, th I've thought of the Hans Zimmer Inception time piece, very moving. I, I went to watch this um, being played at um, Nottingham Theatre by a London Symphony Orchestra. Uh, it, it was Zimmer versus Williams, and yeah. but the that stirring of memories is is a fascinating subject. It's that, I love that phrase, super highway to your memories, in that it, it was played as part of the film Inception. But what, what does my mind go to when I hear it being played? It's the, it was the, during the breaks of Andy Murray's first Wimbledon win, they were playing these slow motion action shots of, of Andy Murray against time. So that's, oh, that's something I, I, I remember very vividly as much as the film. So um, it's amazing how those moments spark uh, those memories and that, that music sparks the memories. And interestingly, just as you speak there, Steve, um, it, it uh, brings back the memory of um, Andy Murray making extensive use of the Black Eyed Peas when actually music was permitted on court. Um, it's not now, um, but there are many anecdotes of uh, athletes tapping the power of music in order to to bring about peak performance. But yeah, those um, artistic moments, and I, I guess this is one of the the great pleasures that we have um, in art is that they can conjure memories, they can make us think about the human condition, they can make us think deeply about ourselves and our aspirations and, and what we want to achieve. I've had many Heineken moments with, um, with music because quite frankly, music really can reach the parts that other artistic stimuli or any any stimuli can't reach. 
maybe that's because I've grown up with music and it's a really intrinsic part of my psyche. But in the research that I've done, I've discovered that same notion with many individuals and, and many athletes, perhaps with one notable exception, Steve. <laughs> um, very early in my academic career, I had the uh, the good fortune of interviewing the double Olympic gold medal winning decathlete Daly Thompson. Um, oh, and I've, I went... I've already before you go any further. I've already got a piece of music in my head. Um, so go on, you. you... Uh, but funnily enough, <laughs> you know, I went in with the notion that somebody of that ilk, who has to conquer ten events and be such a master of his own destiny and, and be able to um, regulate his uh, arousal with perfection in order to perform at his best would invariably tap the potential benefits of music. And of course, he'd seen many of the, the great uh, American athletes, Ed Moses, Willie Banks, uh, make incessant use of music. So I went in with that sort of notion that he would use it um, as a matter of routine. And what was really interesting about Thompson was that he said that music was anathema to him. He would never use it because he was too busy listening to his own body. And I've had other conversations with famous athletes and other notable um, case in point is the uh, multiple uh, record holding distance runner Ron Clark, who never used music. Again, too busy, too busy listening to his own body. And for some athletes, mm. they have a tendency to focus inwardly. If we use a scientific term, they are associators. They focus their attention inwardly on regulating their movement patterns, their breathing rate, their heart rate, and external stimuli such as music can be an unwanted distraction. But there are other types of attentional style, Steve. There are dissociators. These are individuals who have a tendency to focus outwardly. They will be the people asking for the music to be cranked up. Now that might be Joe and Josephine public in your local gym, rather than say an elite distance runner. But for some people, they would find it hard to be habitually active without the presence of music. There's another category, the switcher. Right. This, is, this is an individual who is able to switch their attention in accord with situational demands. So for example, if they're doing something routine and mundane, like moderate intensity circuit training or stretching or a tempo run, then in those instances, they're able to switch out and maybe focus on a musical stimulus and use that just to lift their affective state, lift their mood somewhat. Or, if they're working on a very high intensity form of activity, let's say it's uh, Olympic weightlifting, or let's say it is uh, all out sprinting in an interval type session, then they will be able to switch their attention and associate because that sort of uh, 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 attentional uh, style in that situation will bring about the best results. Uh, and in my career, I've been fighting constantly <laughs> and trying to grapple with trying to understand the relationship between different attentional styles, different intensities of training and exercise, and how to optimize the music. Um, and, and the findings from that have been uh, really interesting and elucidating. Mm. So let me just bookmark um, something there that you said about use of music and, and I'll give you some examples of where athletes I know have been adamant you should not be listening to music. So I, maybe I'll come back to that if I could. Um, but you, you touched upon there, and I've got your book here, um, Costas, Applying it, Music and Exercise and Sport. Um, but um, let me just try and find the right page here. Page 37 where you talk about 
different moderators so musical factors situational factors psychological and personal factors all of those sort of combining to i guess ultimately something that you want to choose you you actually make a choice of, of selecting putting on your playlist or it has a, a a more positive effect um are there any common trends uh, any generic observations about what music needs to be effective in enhancing performance or making exercise more enjoyable or tolerable? Yeah, that it's a really insightful question that you ask, Steve. And um, I'm glad that you've highlighted those various um, personal and situational factors that I, I present in the book. I think you were probably looking at, at the theory that I developed in 2016 which is a heuristic theory, not a mechanistic theory. Heuristic means it's a quick and easy way of understanding a very complex web of factors that accounts for the consequence of music use in sport and exercise. And your question specifically was around some generic factors. So let's just touch on those a little. Um, one of the clear things that has come through is that at high intensities of training and exercise using highly complex music that requires a great deal of processing um, or maybe has complex harmonic patterns or counter melodies. So anything that needs a great deal of processing appears to detract from the task at hand. So you hear about a lot of uh, athletes and exercisers who will choose really cheesy music such as ABBA, for example, to listen to during um, a high intensity workout. That is because that type of music is so readily absorbable and so simple in its structure that it doesn't require a lot of processing. And for me, this was really highlighted in um, a recent program of research that I led over the last three years or so. Thankfully, this happened over the pandemic for the most part when I couldn't do exercise related research. Um, but I, I got a grant from the Economic and Social Research Council to study the influence of music on driving behavior. And one of the key things that I learned from a series of four studies into that was that using um, complex music, uh, music with a great deal of rhythmic accentuation and up-tempo music in a simulated urban environment actually had detrimental effects in terms of driving behavior and predisposing young drivers to greater risk. Interesting. Uh, and also elevated their um, affective arousal levels, how pepped up they felt, to a degree that they were likely to miss important cues in the road, to tailgate, maybe to, to be aggressive. Ultimately, this is borne out with, um, with road rage and with crashes and fatalities. And when I did background research into the area, um, I know this is a slight tangent, but it was amazing to find out in police reports just on how many occasions very loud, aggressive rap music was playing at the scene of accidents. So, you know, clearly music can uh, affect our uh, psychological state, but that in, it, in itself also has a bearing on our behavior. So it can have a, a bearing on the behavior of athletes, but with athletes, there are many complexities that we need to bear into consideration. And one of those complexities, Steve, is that there is huge variability in terms of the optimal level of activation that characterizes peak performance for any given athlete. And as a psychologist, you have to play with that notion and engage in a little bit of, an, a little bit of experimentation with athletes in order to hit upon the music choices or the music program that will optimize their mental state in preparation for a given competition. So for example, um, 
in the year of the London Olympics, I got a, a telephone call from Di Green's management. And Di Green had undergone some knee surgery at the time. You might recall that he was uh, Team GB track and field captain. Um, and his management and sponsors really wanted to give him um, a fillip, a, 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 a pickup. Um, they wanted just to aid a little bit his, his mental preparation for the Olympic Games um, and the precursor competitions. So... Um, I worked together with Dai and his favorite producer, uh, Red Light, who's also quite a well-known uh, DJ. I explored Dai's um, musical predilection. He grew up in the valleys, but he had quite a rap-centric playlist. Um, and then I worked with Red Light in the studio. We put down the skeleton of a track. We got Dai into the studio. He listened to it, gave us feedback. And eventually we came up with a bespoke track for Dai Green uh, titled Talk to the Drum that he used in the lead into those Olympic games and at the games themselves. Unfortunately, it wasn't to be for Dai at those games. He came fourth, as I recall, in the 400 meter hurdles and uh, also got a fourth in the four by 400 meter relay. Um, but en route to the games, I think it was in Rome, he um, broke his PB in the 400 meter hurdles while using uh, that track as part of his uh, preparation. So this approach of studying in detail uh, an athlete's optimal level of activation the constellation of emotions that they associate with peak performance and then either finding or creating music to suit is probably the shape of things to come. Mm. So if I can just go back and touch on a few points there, because that's a fascinating um, exploration of the, of the different effects. And it certainly makes sense what you're saying about, um, about the interference of driving. I, whenever if you if you're sort of driving on the motorway, you can sort of listen to to whatever. As soon as I start going into an un, an uh, uh, unfamiliar environment or town, or I've got to concentrate a little bit more, I always turn the music down, <laughs> regardless. So I'm I'm switching my attention. Does that does that allude to the fact that that there's a negative effect of certain types of music? Um, can you give us an example of what that complex music might might be? Um, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily uh, know off the top of my head. Yeah, it's not it's not just the complexity issues. Complexity is one facet of it. Right. But um, also aggression in the music. If you listen to ACDC or Motorhead, when you're in a stressful urban environment, that's likely to have detrimental effects. It was interesting that you spoke about driving on the highway because we compared um, urban environments and highway environments. And it seemed that drivers needed more stimulation in the urban environment, uh, sorry, in the highway environment yeah, okay. to drive optimally. And there were some um, situation specific differences. So if say in 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 the uh in in western europe we take um a, a musical art form such as uh salsa which comes from cuba which has a a highly syncopated feel is is predicated on the uh, offbeat the engine room of uh, a salsa rhythm section plays something known as the the clave ah uh, ah uh, ah uh. Uh, 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 uh. So there's a very offbeat feel to it. And often you don't know where you are in time and space because salsa music can get so complex. And, and so it, that kind of music can require a, a great deal of processing. It's po possibly not optimal in a situation, a high load situation such as urban driving, where you need to uh, concentrate on multiple visual stimuli. There might be dogs running across the road and pedestrians and people cutting you up uh, and traffic lights and speed cameras and all sorts of things. The other area, by the way, Steve, interestingly, is when you uh, ignite your engine, often people find themselves 
turning the music down from yes. <laughs> the level that they had playing <laughs> the previous night because you really want to tune into what the, the car is doing. So your experiences and the way that you behave with music in the car is uh, entirely typical of how other people would, would use music. And if you don't do that and you are listening to very loud, complex or aggressive music in an urban situation, you are predisposing yourself to greater risk. And just um, just an aside, when you're doing the, this uh, research, are you are you looking at uh, music versus not no music, or are you looking at inspiring music versus non-inspiring music, or different genres of music versus each other? What's the what's the sort of methodological approach that you take to exploring this? Uh, the methodological approach in terms of the selection of music has been been quite varied and diverse in accord with a particular research question. So sometimes it's a case of comparing a particular type of music that we, we think will have the desired effect versus no music. Sometimes it's our um, music with the active ingredients versus music that we don't think that will be uh, particularly uh, effective versus a control. Sometimes if we're looking at the effects of uh, the application of synchronous music, where we're syncing movement rate to music, rather than use a, a no music control, we might use a metronome beep so that we have a steady pulse with which athletes or exercise uh, exercises coordinate their movement rate, but it's devoid of musical properties. Similarly, in a lot of the neurophysiological research that we've done over the last seven or eight years, we have used um, podcasts, for example, wherein there is an auditory stimulus, but it's devoid of musical qualities. Um, interestingly, in those studies, it seems that music gives something above and beyond what a, uh, an athlete or an exerciser might derive from a podcast. Mm. And, and key to that is the, the rhythmical qualities of music. Okay, so um, if, you're, if you're designing the choices of music, um, what are the qualities that you'd be looking for? What are the essential aspects that you'd be thinking? Um, aside from the sort of personal preference or what you've grown up with or, you, your, um, or your, perhaps you might associate with a bad moment in your life, um, what are the sort of qualities? You mentioned ABBA as a very easy, digestible music, piece of music. Um, what, what would be the, the things that, that people would need to look out for? Well, the, the, the premise of all of this is what you're going to use the music for. Right. So if okay. you're going to use it for post-training recuperation, you're probably looking for music that is um, fairly simple in its, in its structure that doesn't have um, complex harmonic progressions, that doesn't jar, that has a tempo range that possibly descends from around 90 to 60 BPM. You might go for music that is instrumental, so you don't need to engage in syntactic processing of the lyrics. If, however, you are selecting music for the belly of a workout when you are at a relatively high intensity, that music might have quite a pronounced rhythm, maybe four to the floor. Uh, 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 uh. It might have a tempo range of about 130 to 140 beats per minute. There might be a lyrical affirmation. Keep on running. Let's get moving. Ain't no mountain high enough or whatever. There are many lyrical affirmations that we can find within music. It may be an artist that particularly uh, inspires you. The the beat of the music will be particularly important and you will extract that and try to feed it into your performance. If, however, you are using music as a precursor to performance, you're using it to inspire yourself, to conjure the right sort of imagery uh, and maybe to get into your uh, uh, to get your game face on, to, to get into the zone, as it were. You need music that will 
possibly have some sort of extra musical association that will conjure the right sort of imagery. So for me, um, if I'm going for a run, I might use a track such as um, Vangelis's Chariots of Fire. Uh, it's a very slow track. The tempo is around resting heart rate. But when I listen to the track, it creates in my mind's eye those images of Olympians of old striding across the sands of St. Andrews in their long white shorts. And I find that really inspiring. It brings the best out of me. And, um, you know, it encourage me, encourages me to go out on a cold, dark night. So that works for me. And with these extra musical associations, they can be very personal. And so people need to find what works specifically for them. And um, and what changes have you seen when designing or comparing different types of music uh, to the, what changes have you seen in the psychophysiology response to exercise? Yeah, when we look at mm. psychophysiology, there are some generalizations that I can speak to today. Um, and the first of those, and, and possibly this is one of the most pervasive findings um, across this uh, area of research, is that playing any type of music during submaximal training or exercise reduces perceived exertion. So a lot of your listeners will be familiar with the uh, rating of perceived exertion scale that was designed and popularized by uh, the Swedish psychophysiologist Gunnar Borg. We've used this a lot in our research. And as an average, music will reduce perceived exertion by about 10%. If people, even if people dislike the music, it will still reduce perceived exertion, right, maybe by about, by about 8%. If the music is optimally selected, it tends to reduce perceived exertion by about 12%. Now, one of the unique contributions that's been made by our body of work here at Brunel is that we confirm the fact that music only reduces perceived exertion at low to moderate intensities of training, but it goes on affecting emotions, our affective state, right up quite close to voluntary exhaustion. So. At high intensities, although music doesn't influence what we feel, it can influence how we feel it. It can have a bearing on how fatigue is colored. And it has a strong bearing on what we call affective memory, how we remember feeling during a training session or an exercise session. Now, of course, athletes are innately highly motivated, and you will know very well that one of the uh, biggest challenges with athletes is to get them to rest to get them to do less to give them sufficient scope for recuperation and there, there's a big science at the moment around recuperation but with joe and josephine public just getting them to the gym and overcoming a lot of the uh, consumer resistances that go hand in hand with physical exercise is a big challenge for us in exercise and sports science. So if you can manipulate how people feel during exercise, you give them a hedonic experience, they are far more likely to engage in exercise, in uh, physical activity on a habitual basis, rather than if you just use traditional cognitivist approaches, you must set goals and you need to really appreciate what the benefits to your health will be of this particular exercise program or read the blog of such and such celebrity. Now, cognitivism still has a role, but if we in exercise science can make the experience enjoyable and immersive um, and uh, more pleasurable, and we do this through a, a number of means, not just music, but uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, video, et cetera, et cetera. There are lots of techniques that we can use, many technology mediated 
to make the training or exercise experience more pleasurable. And um, I would stick my neck out and say in a post pandemic world, using these technologies and music in particular will be a way of addressing the tide of obesity, type two diabetes, sedentariness that we are witnessing in the Western world. Mm. Oh, wow, that's fascinating. So what I'm hearing there is that the lasting memory, the the comments that you're gonna, going to be making as you leave the exercise class, um, that was tough, but that was fun. Oh, that was enjoyable. Um, that that memory is is important in ensuring adherence, going back again, experiencing that again and again. Is that if I have I got that right? You have that uh, absolutely right. Okay. If if you leave the session feeling that it was pleasurable, it was it was immersive, it not just tolerable, but it it was enjoyable then um, the likelihood is that you will engage in the behavior on a regular basis. If, if it was displeasurable, a real chore, you just felt sweaty and breathless and uncomfortable, and it didn't satisfy your psychological needs, the chances are that you will struggle to make that journey to the gym next time. And, and again, so, just... Go on, go on, courses. Yeah, uh, there's th this this notion of um, affective memory exercise, hedonics, affective science has really been gaining a great deal of traction in the exercise psychology literature over the last ten years or so, um, and with uh, Paddy Ekakakis, Jasmine Hutchinson, uh, Yvonne Delavoye Terrell and other professors, I've been part of, of a movement that's really been advocating for the promotion of hedonism in exercise. Uh, we see this as being very important in addressing some of the big physical activity challenges that we face in the Western world. Mm. And can I just get a point of clarification again about the perceived exertion um, is most pronounced during submaximal exercise, but that effective um, influence at the higher intensities is is, is notable. Do, do I take from your um, your discussion there? Is there an increased motivation to actually? Well, you, you might be experiencing high, high levels of perceived exertion at high intensities so it's tough it's still tough but music can affect your motivation to tuck into it get on with it well let's just explore the neuroscience a little bit and i'll, I'll try to use quite um simple language um the efferent nervous system takes messages from our working muscles to the central processor and at relatively high intensities say from 75% of aerobic capacity upwards. There's an automatic attentional switching that takes place and that forces us to focus internally, which means that processing music becomes very difficult indeed at high exercise intensities, okay? Because of the messages that come through the, um, the efferent nervous system. It's analogous to internet bandwidth. Okay. So we have greater bandwidth at lower intensities and music can have uh, a more pronounced effect. However, at those higher intensities, music still seems to touch the affective centers of the brain, such as the cerebellum, the reptilian brain and the amygdala. It doesn't necessarily require processing higher up in the cortex. And perhaps due to that, we have these uh, pleasurable experience that we found at these relatively high intensities of exercise, even though the music is not moderating perceived exertion. So it, it might not influence what you feel, but it can influence how you feel it at those very high intensities. Hmm. Interesting. And, um, 
we we talked we talked a little bit about use of music during training and some athletes not being keen on it um i can remember seeing a world champion runner pulling their head, headphones out of a young athlete's ears you know you shouldn't be doing that you should you should make it harder for yourself you shouldn't make it easier for yourself by using music because you don't have that that music in competition and that's always stuck with me as an interesting practice to make things tough make things harder in training so that your performance is is appropriate but it one of my sort of realizations over the t- over time is that if i don't wear earphones and i don't go out with music is that i develop my own mind's music like an earworm or a rhythm or a or a pattern in my head which sort of plays in my mind i don't know whether it's almost like a substitute it's sort of filling in the gaps it's uh it's it's doing that for me um is that something that you've you've looked into and, and worked on at all yeah that's something that i've worked on uh, a great deal particularly oh. my applied work because really truly understanding what is happening in somebody's head in terms of what they're hearing in their minds here is very tricky uh, mm. experimentally yeah <laughs> um but just to touch on your original point you're quite right that in many competitive arenas music is not permitted um and so it's important that particularly at high intensities athletes are accustomed to training as they would compete so that they can um so they know what what sort of circumstances they're going to meet in the competitive arena at the same time through the process of um auditory imagery you can work with athletes for them to imagine a given track that they can potentially use for pacing in a competitive scenario and research shows not my research but the uh, research of neuroscientist daniel levitin shows that people can recall pieces of music very accurately in terms of tempo usually to within two to three bpm accuracy which means that if you're using it as a pacing tool but not actually playing it just imagining it in a competitive scenario it can be effective so there is that potential application, but it does take a little bit of practice and preparation, just like any form of imagery skill that a sports psychologist might apply. Hmm. So um, in essence, you know, I, I can understand that athlete that pulled the, the, the headphones away. There is a time and place for headphones, things that are laborious and mundane and routine that boredom can be alleviated and and the whole experience can be be made more interesting and engaging with music. But there are instances in elite sport where you need to focus on the relevant, the whole relevance and nothing but the relevant. And music can be an unwanted distraction. So I'm not suggesting today that music is a be all and end all. What I am saying is it's one of the many tools that we have in our toolbox as practitioners. And it's important that we use it in a judicious manner in order to get the very best out of it. Mm. And um, and how does that vary for team sports, where you might have a playlist playing in the dressing room, where you've got certain personalities who will bounce off that and respond to that music, but others, they might find that annoying or it might confuse them or it might intensify them unnecessarily how does that play out that's something i've had to uh, grapple with and i've encountered many times during my professional career um the the great uh, roman philosopher lucretius said that one man's meat is another man's poison and if we translate that into modern day parlance one person's music is another person's noise And so it's not the case that one size fits all. And in any given changing room, there will be a variety of musical predilections, a variety of musical backgrounds, 
social cultural backgrounds and preferences. You know, take the changing room at Chelsea, for example, where you have many different cultures represented. One of the things that I've advocated, and you may have read in my book, is the notion of democratizing the music selection. So it's not the case of one captain or one team manager imposing their musical preferences on others, but gauging what various musical predilections are within the group, finding some common ground, maybe using those pieces of music at some low level events, such as um, pre-season fixtures, and together finding pieces of music that are really going to engender the sort of mindset that the team is looking for. Mm. Sometimes these um, pieces of music um, emerge just through the, the, the media or they become commonly accepted. Um, I remember back in, um, in 1996 when uh, England were facing Germany in the uh, soccer Euros. And um, as England were entering the, the hallowed turf at Wembley Stadium, there was this deafening shrill of, it's coming home, it's coming, football's coming home. Three Lions, Badil and Skinner. And I got the pilo erection. It was as though the music had this transcendent effect. It raised the, the level of the game from a mere soccer competition to a stage for the nation's hopes and dreams. It wasn't to be for England on that occasion, Steve. They went out on penalties. But nonetheless, I felt that was a watershed moment in terms of uniting the supporters with the players and really uh, elevating the emotional intensity of that particular sporting occasion. That's that's interesting in that sense that uh, I wonder whether there is a familiarization to the, the playlist, that if we play these tracks consistently before we perform, then we'll fall in love with it, we'll get used to it, it will support us in providing us with structure, familiarity, that we are getting ready, even if it might not be my choice. And that just got me thinking there, but certainly for international competitions, the last track that you're going to hear is the national anthem, probably. So it's, it's, you might not enjoy that, you might not necessarily want to sing along to it, but it's part of the routine. Um, and, and so that got me thinking a little bit about whether those those national anthem moments can tip people over almost too much. The, or the, the fans, the reception, the, 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 the singing can, can tip people over if they're not careful about how they're managing their emotions in that moment. Well, yeah, it's not unusual to see tears running from a, a yeah. Welsh rugby union's players' uh, cheek when they hear the national anthem. And of course, this can induce hugely patriotic feelings and the hope is that these feelings can be used within the intensity of that situation and be fed um, into the performance of the players. In many cultures, Steve, the word for music and dance is exactly the same. Um, Maori culture, for example, and we see the example of the New Zealand national rugby team, the All Blacks, and the tribal right of the haka that they used to lay down the challenge to their uh, opposing teams, which is a combination of chanting and dance that is really quite fearsome and uh, activates them and preps them mentally for the task at hand. Generally speaking, you talk about tipping people over the edge. And we've mentioned already about um, there being huge variants across individuals in terms of optimal arousal. It's also the case that there, there is huge variance across athletic disciplines. And the sort of arousal that a darts player might need or a snooker player might need is very different to the sort of arousal that a rugby player might need 
or a weightlifter might need. And so this also needs to be borne into consideration when selecting the music. The other thing that you said that's really interesting is that indeed the, the last piece of music that you hear tends to stay in your head. So if you're going to have an earworm, you better make sure that it's a really um, positive uh, earworm. Um, and I remember a few years back, I was working with uh, with an athlete, an athlete that had quite a lot of success at a national level um, to protect the identity of uh, of the athlete. I won't give the, the surname, but the first name was Jenny. Um, and this individual had uh, been through some injury and trauma and coming up to a national championship um, was really extremely anxious and questioning herself. And I had the idea of using um, Jennifer Lopez's track, Jenny from the Block. And I set that to some highlight mo moments of um, Jenny's athletic career and used it as the very last thing that she saw and heard as she entered the fray. And it had a, an incredible influence on her um, psychologically. The combination of uh, the, the imagery and the music and the music seemingly being um, so personal, you know. Mm. I'm still Jenny, I'm still um, Jenny from the block. Doesn't matter about the, the rocks that I got, I'm still Jenny from the block. You know, taking her back to, to what she really was, her psychological core. Um, so yeah, you can take advantage of lyrics quite easily in music. I'm now just trying to wonder how many songs have got the word Steve in it. Um, maybe the Feast of Stephen, I don't know. Maybe there's uh, something <laughs> there. the Feast I'm, of Stephen. <laughs> I'm not sure that's gonna help. We're a little, little late now for Christmas. <laughs> so the, the hacker, it was interesting you mentioned that because I, um, Rachel and I went to, to, on our honeymoon to New Zealand and we went to a cultural evening down in um, Queenstown and um, and they performed a number of different hackers that, and then explained the meaning for them. And they said, is anyone here on their honeymoon? And we said, we put our hands up and it was exciting. And they, they said, we're going to perform a love, uh, love themed hacker for you. And um, boy, it was aggressive. It was, it was like war. <laughs> um, and I, it got me thinking about the sort of cultural influences and how, how important that is to sort of our, our background and our upbringing about the things that resonate most with us as a, as a tribe. Just as you mentioned about your background and, and the songs that you grew up with that, that have that nostalgic in, in, impact, but also the meaning to your nation too. Well, firstly, I hope that uh, cultural hacker didn't do you any permanent damage, Steve. No, we're still together. <laughs> we're still good. Yeah, 25 years together. <laughs> but um, the the kind of musical background that you have, and in particular what your parents listened to as you were growing up, peer group influences, what you heard on um, the radio, these things will have uh, a really important influence on your musical predilections today and and generally what we find is that those who had relatively sophisticated listening backgrounds and maybe played a, a musical instrument grow up to have more sophisticated listening backgrounds when when they're adults so when i was young and where i grew up in south london i, I listened to the full gamut of um west indian music or West Indian um, uh, influenced uh, music, um, starting uh, from from ska, and then you know later on, uh, rap music was very popular, uh, and house and all the rest of it. Um, but eventually, I found my path into jazz, into uh, modal, modal music, into into fusion. And when I think structurally about the music that I like, I can. I can trace many of its roots back to the music that I was listening to when I was very young. And it, it, what I listen to now just simply represents an evolution in terms of what I was listening to when I was a young boy. Uh, and I think 
that sort of auditory journey is one that's replicated in many people's travel logs and in many people's relationships with music insofar as what they listen to when they're young and any reminiscent bumps that they have do have an influence on what they like uh, and what they're drawn towards in later life. Mm. Look, this is fascinating, Costas, and I'm uh, really enjoying this conversation. And maybe just a, a last couple of questions, if I could, just to wrap things up for people. But um, one, one about just a curious question around um, the application of this to sort of everyday life in that, that, you know, sometimes we're not having a good day. Sometimes we need to, to, to step up. Either that is switch from feeling a bit miserable or a bit grotty um, through to actually, this is now a really important moment. and I need to step up whether it's exercise or not. Is there an application there? How music can cue us into, into the right mood to be at our best when the moment really matters just as music can prime us for a challenging sporting situation it can prime us and prepare us mentally for many other situations in our lives be that an interview uh, a public oration dealing with uh, an uncomfortable situation such as a meeting that we don't want to have we all have those uncomfortable situations in life and sometimes we just feel grotty you know, particularly at the time of year when um, the, the days are short and the nights are long and it's cold. So I find listening to tracks such as um, Bill Withers' Lovely Day, or I Can See Clearly Now and all the extra musical associations with the film Cool Runnings um, can have a really beneficial effect on, on my mood. Um, again, this is one where I think it can be very individual. And people should purposefully seek tracks that make them feel in a certain way and can maybe switch their mood into a more positive groove. Uh, and to have those tracks to, to hand on their phone or on their hi-fi so they can use them uh, at those critical points in their lives. Mm. And is that the, the same simple advice that you would give to people if they are now inspired to create a Spotify playlist, thinking, well, I, I might need one for getting in the zone. I might need something to, to help me through some exercise and I might need something to, to wind me down um, to, to make those choices meticulously in the same way. Well, Steve, what our research has shown is that music needs to, to contour various activities, even within one activity, an exercise activity, there'll be a mental preparation, there'll be a warm up, there'll be low intensity, moderate intensity, high intensity, warm down, recuperation. Each of those phases will require their own music. And, and similarly for different situations in life, um, there will be different tracks that might be optimal. So if you're studying, for example, you might like some very gentle classical music, such as that of uh, Mozart. Or if you want to get off to sleep, you might use a little bit of Bach, such as Air on a G-String. It has a very, very slow tempo and slow changing harmonies. So think about the circumstances, the situation, what sort of mindset you want to engender your musical preferences, and then try as best as you can to marry the music with the situation and your personality, then you're likely to make a very positive choice. Wonderful. And do you have Spotify playlists? Because I noticed in your book, you've got some suggested playlists. And when I, when I looked through those, I just thought, gosh, that's, that's a great uh, set, selection of, of music that scientifically has got some some backing as to having an effect for you. Do you have a playlist that you, you provide to people? Yeah, there's a, a free range of playlists that we provide uh, via Spotify. Oh, brilliant. Um, if your listeners use at Savvy Brunel, um, they can find playlists for a very broad range of situations. 
even for leaders such as yourself, Steve. So even for leaders. So hopefully you can find something on there. Well, we're going to put the um, link to that into the show notes so people can go and have a have a look. Um, is there anywhere else, Costas, that people can get uh, to follow along? Um, any resources that they can tap into that you'd like to highlight? Our group has a, a Twitter account, which is at Savvy Brunel. And we post a lot of interesting detail about the latest research, um, items in the media, anecdotes, playlists, almost on a daily basis uh, on that Twitter account. And so if anyone's interested, they can uh, interact with us right there. Fantastic. We'll include that too. But Costas, thank you so much for the conversation. It's been fantastic. Uh, what a wonderful area for, to research. It, uh, I can only imagine it's a great joy to, to engage in this subject every day. Um, it's it's good to engage, but it's also something that takes over your whole life. The, <laughs> the more the more questions you address, that the the more come up. <laughs> You're constantly fighting to find the time to address those questions. Fantastic, Costa. Thank you. All the best.